All right, hey everyone, my name is Maria, and I'm going to be talking to you about reactive programming. Um, it's basically going to be just a two-part talk. The first part, we're going to define what reactive programming is, and then we're going to explore one of its sort of more interesting features, which is observables. Uh, so reactive programming, I first want to clarify what it's not. Um, it's not programming with React.js. Uh, it's completely separate from React, React Redux, React Router, and things like that. Um, and the second point is a little more nuanced. It's not RxJS, which is the reactive extensions library for JavaScript. Um, so actually, RxJS is reactive programming, and we're going to be talking about that a lot in this talk. But I just want to draw this distinction here that reactive programming is a concept or a paradigm, and it's not reducible to any individual library that implements it. So, you know, reactive, uh, RxJS implements it, so does BaconJS. Um, but reactive programming itself is a concept. I would sort of compare this to how, like, promises are not Bluebird, but Bluebird is an implementation of promises. So, as a bona fide concept, it's got a nice online manifesto. Um, so, I pulled a few quotes from the online manifesto. Um, the first sort of sets the context for reactive programming. Um, today's demands are simply not met by yesterday's software architectures. So now when you're designing for the front end, uh, you have to manage a lot of state, a lot of asynchronous behavior in your apps, and this is just not what programs did, or what, this is not what web apps did many years ago. And so now our standards are really high. We want systems that are responsive, resilient, elastic, and message-driven. So those are sort of the four pillars of reactive programming. Responsiveness, you probably understand. It's like responding to state changes, responding to user input. Um, resilience has to do with your app still needing to preserve that responsiveness, even if you have like intermittent server failure. Um, elasticity is whether you can handle different amounts of traffic on your web app and still kind of s stay really seamless. And message driven is sort of, um, is sort of saying like event driven, except in reactive program programming, you think of events as uh, messages and your data as messages as opposed to events. So, uh, I guess the take home definition would be that reactive programming is a paradigm for asynchronous programming using data streams. And so, this last part, using data streams, is like the nifty, uh, one really nifty part of reactive programming, which we'll talk about, which is observables. Um, so, just like maybe a little contrast, here's the way I think that I have been used to thinking about events. Um, this is Old Faithful. And basically, if you're trying to subscribe to a set of events, you want to maybe know about the mouse moves on a div. You would like, send a bunch of listeners to kind of gather around that div, um, put it directly on the source, and when the events get emitted, it calls each of those listeners. Um, with data streams, this is how I visualize it. Um, you think of your events coming onto the page as sort of like a horde of events that you need to process turn into really elegant streams that you can then, um, uh, sorry, my sorry, my sidebar is there, but that you can then sort of control and see in a more predictable and uh, like easy to manage way. So this is the Coca-Cola plant. Um, and I think there's a really interesting question that reactive programming raises, which is um, to say, like, what really distinguishes an array which is just like a sequence of elements from a series of events, which is also sort of like a series of events that occur over time. So again, for the visual impact, we'll go back. Um, an array is just like a collection of items. They happen in sequence. You can iterate over them using methods like map, reduce, or filter. And wouldn't it be nice if you could take an event, a uh, series of events, and use those similar methods on top of it? Say so like maybe take all of your mouse moves, dot for each off of them, dot map, and dot reduce. So that is where um, RxJS comes in and really shines. Um, people sometimes call it the lodash for a events in async. Um, it is a, it's called reactive extensions because you can just basically import it into your uh, program and it brings all these methods along with it and all these objects that you can use. Um, and it's not just available for JavaScript, it's also, there are a couple more languages listed here that you can um, use RxJS with, or sorry, uh, reactive extensions with. So here's a demonstration of, this is how you might have written um, some program before using RxJS. This one takes a, say you have a box on your page, you want to just drag it across the page by listening to a mouse down on the box, listen to the mouse move to move the coordinates, and then mouse up to release the box. So you would uh, go ahead and grab the box, 
uh, create some handlers for it. And you then attach the handlers to the box. And then when you're done, you say, you know, remove those event listeners when you see a mouse up, and so on and so forth. So you can probably generally understand what's going on here, but you can see that it's really imperative, right? You're just, um, it's not a very declarative way of coding. So with RxJS, you can do something like this. You're still grabbing the box, but now you're using the RxJS library to create three data streams. So these are event streams, and they represent the stream of uh, user events for, here it's the mouse down on that box. Uh, and then another stream for mouse moves across the page, um, across the document, and then mouse ups across the document. So what you do is you listen to the mouse downs in the box, and then you map over that. And so for every time someone clicks down in a box, you create, you start listening to the mouse moves stream. So now you're uh, listening to this stream. Uh, you map over it so that you extract the x and y coordinates, and then you do that until you see a mouse up. Uh, concat all, and then just move the, move the box. So I think immediately this seems really declarative and really nice and a nice way of interacting with your events in a way that is probably intuitive if you ever work with uh, like kind of like a, a stream of mouse moves. But I guess even now it's not too obvious how this is a lot better, so, or a lot better for like a complicated endeavor. So here's something that you might see in your own capstone projects. You might be trying to design a search bar. Um, this is an example I pulled from online, and you can see that one of the things they're doing is they're kind of like debouncing the input. You don't want to query your database every time somebody types a letter. You probably want to wait until something meaningful actually shows up in your search bar, and then you populate the results. Um, and say you also want to handle um, intermittent server failure as well, and you want to safeguard against race conditions. So those are like the three things that you want. And if you could just imagine for a moment what it might look like if you were trying to do this in the normal like uh, callback style of event handling. Um, oops. Uh, so this is the RxJS answer to that problem. Um, you take, you create a stream uh, using Rx observable from, uh, you know, either this is your button or your form, and you listen to all the mouse downs. Oh, sorry, this should be key presses actually. This is a typo. Uh, so you listen to the key presses there. And then um, all you have to do is use these really nice declarative methods. So you would throttle that to make sure that you're not sending query, queries out for every key press. And then when you do start sending out your queries, you can put this method here, which retries, just in case your server is kind of blinking and giving you intermittent failure. And you do that until someone starts uh, pressing a key again. And then you kind of restart this whole chain. So this is a really, really nice and elegant and readable way to, to solve that particular problem. Um, so sort of what's really nice about this style of programming is that events are becoming sort of first class. You can pass them around. You can compose them together. Here is an example of taking two events and like merging them together. You could even dot filter off of this and create a new stream of events that are, that's more relevant to what you're looking for. Um, and use, you know, reduce or, in, or just any like of the functional methods that we're already really, f really familiar with from working with arrays. Um, RxJS says that pretty much anything can be an observable. You could take a normal array and turn it into an observable. You probably wouldn't want to. Um, you could take a stream of events occurring over time. And here, I think this is probably maybe a cool thing to demo. So I'll just put this in the console since I've already imported. Uh, oops, it's not working. Okay, so here's the console and see if this works. Okay, so yeah, here we're creating an observable from this stopwatch that just basically counts up. And we're subscribing to it and listening using RxJS. And it kind of listens to that until, we've tell, until we tell it to stop. Get rid of this again. Um, you can also take promises and uh, turn them into observables. I don't know if this is too clear to see, but let's, let's do that. So this is an observable creating from a promise. Uh, it fetches this like kind of placeholder text, but it is a real Ajax request. And it, there was sort of like a pause, and then the Ajax request completed. 
Um, so there's a lot of more interesting features of RxJS that I don't really have time to get into here, but I like highly recommend that you guys check it out. Um, it is a really relevant paradigm of programming. These are some of the places that use it. Microsoft is developing RxJS 5, and Netflix is, I guess you can notice that there, a lot of these platforms are like streaming platforms, so you know that they handle a lot of asynchronicity and uh, they stream a lot of data, so they think that this is a good solution to that particular problem. Um, and here are some resources that I've used. Uh, again, I think Netflix is actually really good at ev evangelizing this topic. Um, they have some really great YouTube videos online. And with that, I guess, go out and observe your observables. And thanks. <laughs> <laughs>